But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Susan Hegard. I'm the president of the Midwestern Higher Education Compact, or MEC is the acronym. Um, we are one of four higher ed uh, compacts, uh, regional compacts in the country. The others are WICHE, SREB, and NEBI. And um, I'm really pleased to, uh, this morning, we're, we have 131 people registered for this, which is um, really exciting. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Uh, this is um, exciting for us. We're partnering um, with co the Council of State Governance, uh, Governments Midwestern Legislative Conference. And um, I'm really happy to be joined by my colleague, Mike McCabe, who's the director of um, CSG Mid the CSG Midwestern Legislative Conference. And this is our second um, uh, Zoom related um, virtual forum, but this is really the first time that our two organizations have partnered together, which I think is just uh, uh, something that we're really proud of and looking forward to. Um, we've been partners for a long time. In fact, MEC grew out of uh, CSG, um, Midwest Le Midwestern Legislative Conference, and um, we really, we attend each other's meetings and I'm sure footprint with the exception of Missouri, uh, which is part of MEC, but not part of um, MLC. I wanted to walk through um, some logistics this morning since we have lots of people um, joining us today, which is both um, um, great, but also sometimes a challenge. We're gonna ask you to please mute yourself if you're not speaking. And um, I think our, uh, my fabulous colleagues, Mary and Katie will mute all of us in the event that we don't mute ourselves. So we love our dogs, we love our kids, um, the lawnmower outside, but um, if you could just make sure your mute function's on, uh, that would be great. We're gonna lead off um, with a presentation um, by Tom Harnish, uh, and then uh, Mike will introduce our three uh, legislators who have graciously um, offered to speak um, with you today. Um, the questions will be uh, come up on a ch with a chat function on the side panel here. So if you're not sure how to um, access that, it's on your main screen of your Zoom here, and, it, and there's a little kind of a uh, box that says chat. So just click on that and then you'll be able to see the questions as they pop up. We'll be able to keep track of those questions. Um, uh, both Mike and I will be sort of sharing the um, asking of the questions. Uh, and then I would just ask you to, you know, we, if somebody's put on the spot, you know, they, they'll try to answer, but they may, uh, may not. And so we're going to do our best um, together responding to your questions, but there may be some that need additional research or follow up and we'll keep track of that as well. Uh, I think I'm well, also recording um, this session, so it'll be accessible on both of our websites as well. Katie, am I forgetting anything? Nope, that's everything. Okay, great. All right, so let's get started, um, given the time. And uh, I wanted to introduce Tom Harnish, um, who is uh, with us this morning and is going to kick this off. Tom. Uh, is the Vice President of Government Relations um, with SHIO uh, um, uh, and heading up their Washington DC office. Um, and uh, Tom, I'll ask you to say a few words about yourself too, but um, Tom previously was with the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, or ASCU, the acronym. And um, he was actually uh, a, an intern with us um, at Mac years ago. And most importantly, um, uh, Tom is a native Wisconsin, um, uh, native Wisconsinite, Wisconsinian, and he's a Packers fan, of course. Uh, and I know he likes his cheese and his beer. So Absolutely. with that, I'll hand this over to Tom. Tom, say a few words, and um, then we'll get started. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Susan, and uh, the MEC team, as well as CSG, for putting this together. It, it's great to see everyone uh, mm -hmm. and, and to talk about these important issues. And, and thank you for the introduction. Yes, I am from uh, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm a, a native of uh, central Wisconsin. And I uh, got my first professional experience actually um, in the uh, Wisconsin State Assembly. And uh, I, I built out my career from there. So I have just uh, incredible respect for the work that you all do uh, on, on a daily basis. So uh, thank you all for, for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, right now to, to talk about uh, higher education policy in this uh, really challenging uh, COVID environment. And so with that, Susan, I'd like to, to uh, uh, move forward and I'm going to share my screen and we can get right into the PowerPoint presentation and I'd be happy to answer um, throughout the presentation any uh, any questions you might have um, or feel free um, if you have any questions later to, to shoot me an email I'd be happy to to help in, in in any way I can so I'm going to go ahead and 
share my screen here. And can everybody, can everybody see that? Okay, we're good. Okay, so um, I, as, as Susan said, I work at the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association, um, also known as SHEO. And SHEO is a, an association uh, based in Boulder, Colorado, and we just opened a Washington DC office. Um, and that, and SHEO uh, represents uh, state higher education leaders and agency heads. So in uh, my home state of Wisconsin, we would represent the, the University of Wisconsin system. Uh, in Iowa, we would represent the Iowa Board of Regents. Um, in, in Michigan, it would be the Michigan Association of State Universities. So um, uh, agencies and systems of higher education like that throughout uh, the country. We've been a presence on the uh, higher education scene now for, for 66 years and our commitment um, is to equitable education for all Americans um, without respect to race and ethnicity, gender, or socioeconomic factors. And so for today, I'd like to talk about um, the, the federal response um, to, to the COVID-19 crisis as it relates to higher education uh, and as, as it relates to, to states. So just to get right into it, uh, the, some of the issues that I'd like to touch on today. So the pre-crisis uh, higher education uh, financing context. So where we came in um, as far as higher education funding was concerned before this crisis began the pandemic's effect on campus budgets, on state higher education budgets, um, some of the economic indicators uh, that are important right now, um, the CARES Act, which uh, President Trump signed on March 27th, uh, requests for additional support, uh, the HEROES Act that passed the House of Representatives on Friday, and then the uh, next steps. So state higher education funding nationally. So just to provide some background and context of of higher education funding and where it's been at in recent years. This is a national uh, picture of state higher education funding from my organization, SHEO. And what you see in this chart is the, the red uh, line is enrollment. The green line is uh, the, tu the net tuition. So this is tuition minus grant aid and, and things like that. So the net tuition that students pay and then the uh, state appropriations. So as you can see here, the state appropriations uh, are, are very tightly linked uh, to the economic cycle. So uh, it really kind of hit a, a pit uh, after the, 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 the Great Recession uh, and, and after the Stimulus Act uh, faded away. And then states have been um, slowly increasing their funding for, uh, for higher education in recent years. Nationally, states are about two thirds of the way back from um, where they were pre-recession. Now, again, this is a national picture. Uh, if you go on our website, chef, S-H-E-F uh, dot shio dot org, uh, and you uh, can see this, and we are, it's an interactive a tool that you can use, uh, and will also show in your state uh, the breakdown and the wave chart that we have here. Um, and, and your state's uh, state higher education funding uh, and, and, and how that relates to tuition. So that is the, the context that we come into this. So states uh, have been uh, making progress in recent years uh, on higher education funding, uh, but, and, and some of them are indeed in a better position than they were before the Great Recession. Um, well, most I would say uh, are, are not. So that is the, the context we come into this, this, this crisis with. And then, of course, we had the, uh, the, uh, the pandemic, and this had numerous effects on, on campus higher education budgets. So if we're looking at a campus budgets, what do you have? Well, uh, losses in, in tuition and fee revenue, and I kind of allude, that, allude to that at the bottom as well, and we'll talk about that. Losses in campus auxiliary revenue. So uh, campus auxiliary revenue. So those are kind of the, the other parts of campus um, where they, they generate revenue. So those are the, um, this is housing, uh, the dormitories, uh, dining, uh, parking revenue, uh, canceled events. Uh, this is summer camps um, that you might send your kids to. So all of those other auxiliary revenues um, are, are universities are experiencing considerable losses and that helps cross subsidize uh, other areas of, of campus operations. Increased cost. So we have an increased cost due to the, the pandemic. So we have, are moving uh, employees to remote access. Uh, we have to bring in consultants, 
uh, purchasing laptops, webcams, et cetera. So um, the cost to online education uh, is, is not free. And that came with, with increased cost for campuses. Drops in research revenues, cleaning and sanitation costs, uh, and then a, a, a bevy of other costs um, and, and lost revenues uh, for, for colleges and universities in this, in this environment. Certainly during the summer courses, um, I, we expect to, to lose revenue that we would have, have counted on. And then the big, the big question that we have right now is, is fall enrollment. So um, there are some, I was listening to, to the American Council on Education, they're projected about a 15% drop nationally. Again, this will vary from state to state, campus to campus, uh, including a sharp drop though uh, in international students. And international students, uh, again, they pay full freight and they help uh, subsidize um, uh, domestic students. So international students are incredibly important, um, not just for the, the diversity that they bring and the perspectives that they bring and how, and how they help globalize the campus, but also uh, the revenue that they bring in to the campus as well. So we transition then for public higher education. Uh, public higher education, uh, as all of you know, uh, is uh, subsidized by the state and states are going to be facing losses um, in, in their budgets due to the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, just some estimates that we're seeing from Moody's Analytics um, that states are gonna be facing revenue drops between 158 and $203 billion from 18 to 23%. Uh, the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, which is a left-leaning think tank, um, is a 10% shortfall for the current fiscal year and then 25% um, they're looking at for FY21. Uh, they have a report where they're um, uh, where they're uh, they have the state budgets offices, the, all 50 states that they're tracking right now, and you can go on their website and and they have it all sourced by each state budget department. Um, higher education uh, certainly is a um, is a place that would be vulnerable to cuts. Um, one of potentially the the top budget item that would be. Um, uh, for cuts because they have alternative revenue streams in the form of tuition and fees, as well as being a, a discretionary budget item in state budgets. So just a sample, and I know that some of the people here uh, on the line uh, are in you know, Missouri and Ohio and can speak to, to the budget dynamics there, but those are just some of, just a sample of, of what I've seen uh, in the states thus far. Uh, it's, it's many of these things, uh, as you all know, are, are in progress right now. Um, and, and some of it will depend on the actions um, of Congress. Uh, the economy, um, if you haven't seen it already, uh, there was a really uh, great interview with Scott Pelley last night of the uh, Federal Reserve Chair, Jay Powell, uh, on 60 Minutes, talking about the, the employment situation and, and the risk of long-term damage to the economy if people are, are separated from the workforce and we go long, through a prolonged recession. So uh, what we're looking at though from the US Census, uh, from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics is an April unemployment rate of 14.7%. The underemployment rate uh, is near 23%. And then some facts that I saw from the recent Federal Reserve Survey that's uh, on their website um, with 39% 39 uh, of the people uh, in a household uh, below $40,000 uh, reported a job loss in March. Uh, and then 19% of all adults reported either losing a job or experience a reduction in work hours uh, in, in March. So uh, collectively, this, um, the, the economic changes and the, the economic downturn will certainly put pressure on policymakers um, in, at the federal level um, for, for an intervention uh, in, the, in the weeks and months ahead. Okay, so we did have, uh, we've had several policy interventions. Um, we've had now, I would say four stimulus bills. Um, and the one of them uh, certainly was, was the biggest. Um, that was the third stimulus bill called the CARES Act uh, that was signed by President Trump on uh, March 27th. And the CARES Act was designed um, as alternative or excuse me, as emergency aid to institutions, this is in the higher education context, of course, was designed as emergency aid to institutions, public, private, and for-profit, and students due to changes in instructional delivery. So this is really getting at, when I was talking about the, the um, 
losses to institutions and losses to states. This is really geared toward the losses um, to, to institutions. And so this was really emergency aid. And if you look at the, the way the law is written, um, it is really geared toward those costs associated with changes uh, in instructional delivery. Most higher education funding um, did not go through states. It went directly to institutions via the Department of, of Education. And again, this did not really deal with the underlying state budget dynamics. So again, it, affect, it was really directed at uh, those, those uh, campus costs associated with the pandemic. Uh, it included 30.75 billion for education, K-12 and higher ed. 3 billion to governors. So I'm sure many of you are aware that uh, governors will be collectively receiving about $3 billion for K-12 and higher education priorities. Approximately for, for higher education, there's $14 billion that will go out uh, directly to, to institutions with 6.3 of that reserved for cash student grants. So that's debit cards, that's checks, um, that is electronic trans funds transfer, um, that is direct aid to, to neediest, uh, neediest students. Um, of interest um, for, for legislators certainly is magnets of effort requirements. So uh, magnets of effort requirements are, are provisions in federal law that require uh, states to maintain funding at some, at some threshold. And for this bill, uh, this was one of those provisions that was volleyed back and forth in this, the original Senate bill, then the House bill, then the final bill. And they went from having no maintenance of effort to a very strong maintenance of effort to having a maintenance of effort that was fairly weak. And what I mean by that is it, it required states to maintain their funding at the average of the last three fiscal years, um, their funding for K-12 and higher ed. But um, it included a waiver provision from the Department of Education if they could claim um, that they've had a precipitous drop in, in state funding. So what we're seeing is that states, um, I think that most states, maybe all, will likely apply for that waiver um, for the magnets of effort requirements. So that, um, that is the, the, the CARES Act. And certainly there was some concern about the design of the bill, um, including um, that all institutions, Title IV, um, that participate in Title IV received funding, uh, including very tiny institutions um, that received uh, at least half a million dollars. So um, these are institutions with you know, 50 students and the like. So there's some, certainly some um, concern about, um, about the administration of, of this, this, this legislative package. But the magnets of effort requirement, um, just one last point, the magnets of effort requirement in this did not apply to the higher education funding. Uh, the higher education funding there, that 14 billion state uh, institutions were gonna get regardless. Remember that money bypassed states. So they, they could not attach a magnets of effort requirement. The magnets of effort requirement only applied to the $3 billion for governors and the K-12 uh, education funding. So um, that funding uh, is being distributed to, to institutions and states as we speak. Um, but there was a, a, certainly a sense from, from states and from institutions of higher education um, that the costs associated with the pandemic will far exceed the funding uh, in the CARES Act. Uh, the National Governors Association, which is a bipartisan uh, organization of governors, uh, has asked for, for $500 billion to the states. Um, that would be um, with, with very broad flexibility to give to the states to address uh, their needs. Um, SHEO, my organization, uh, again, it's a, it's a nonpartisan organization. Uh, we are asking for 30, we asked for $31.2 billion in block grants to states. Um, and then the presidential associations, these are the presidents of colleges and universities. Um, they asked for uh, money in a similar form to CARES Act, about $46.6 um, uh, billion. And so now we come to uh, the response to that, um, which is a bill that passed the House of Representatives. Um, this is House Democrats bill uh, called the HEROES Act. Uh, this would be $90 billion to states for education. 65% uh, of that funding or nearly 58, um, would, 58 billion would go to um, states for K-12 education. 30% uh, of the funds or nearly 27 would go to public higher education. 
And then it appears that that last 3% um, is, is discretionary funding for states. Um, how, what is the role of the state in this bill? The role of the state in this bill is essentially as a pass-through. So for public, higher, for public higher education, at least, it would be a pass-through. So they would receive, um, they, would have, they would get the money from the federal government, and then the uh, states would have to distribute it 75% based on the Pell enrollment at an institution relative to other institutions in the state, and then 25% based on, on headcount. So, uh, and this would have a wide variety uh, in the use of, of, of funds. So institutions could use this for a variety of, of their needs. And then each institution with at least 500 students um, would receive $1 million. Of interest in this uh, HEROES Act is that it has a very strong magnets of effort provision. Some would even argue that this is an unrealistic at this time magnets of effort provision, um, that it has at least the average of the last three years preceding the legislation on a per student basis, uh, as well as the uh, percent of total spending on elementary, secondary, and post-secondary education. So the share of the pie for, um, for education writ large has to remain the same, as well as the per student funding for higher education in the next three fiscal years has to be maintained at the level that it was in FY, FY19. So uh, very, um, very strong uh, magnets of effort provision. It does certainly include funds to, uh, to private institutions, about $7 billion to, to private institutions. Um, and then there's, there's a few billion for uh, specialized institutions and minority serving institutions. There are a variety of other provisions in here with respect to, to uh, stu ex sus the, the suspension of student loan payments um, and um, so students won't have to pay on their student loans until July or excuse me, September of 2021 um, and, and up to $10,000 in relief for economically distressed borrowers. So, um, and, it would, and this would apply to all enrolled students at the institution, um, including uh, undocumented students, DACA students, as well as uh, international student populations. And then there are some, uh, some measures in there uh, for, for lending to institutions. Um, this, uh, this COVID pandemic, particularly for uh, small private institutions, had led to a cash crunch. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in the higher education community for um, access to, to capital right now um, to help them get through this, this difficult situation. Uh, so the next steps, just to finish up here, the HEROES Act will not likely be taken up in the Senate, uh, but rather this is the House's marker for future negotiations. Uh, the Senate wants to see the CARES Act be fully implemented um, for considering another stimulus bill. So there's a, uh, a share of the, the CARES Act that hasn't been distributed yet. So they want to, to see the CARES Act play out um, and, then, uh, and then look um, from there to see what the challenges are. Um, and then certainly Senator McConnell, uh, who's the, the Senate GOP leader, uh, he is concerned about the, the national debt levels. Uh, he's also concerned about liability protections uh, in, the, uh, in, the next, uh, in the next piece of legislation. It, the timetable remains unclear. We don't think that anything is going to get serious uh, on the Senate side until, until at least June. Um, and then as far as the fall goes, um, a lot of decisions are, are in progress right now. I just saw Cal State, which is the largest public four-year four system in the country, um, they are going to go fully virtual um, this fall, uh, but again, it depends from state to state and, and campus to campus of how those um, decisions are being made. But again, um, Senator McConnell talked about liability and many campus leaders remain concerned about uh, a liability um, as, as students come back to campus uh, in the fall. So with that, um, I do have on here, if anyone's interested in a daily email of, we kind of provide the blow by blow of what's going on uh, in higher education policy, both here in Washington and in the States. Uh, it's available at, uh, at shio.org. And uh, it's a free subscription to everyone. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email and, and Twitter handle is below. So with that, Susan, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we can uh, move on to the next presenters. Thank you, uh, Tom, very, very much for, um, for your presentation and um, I know there's some questions for Tom that are coming up along the way and we'll get to some of those as we move forward. Um, I'm gonna now hand this off to Mike.
Mike? Great, thank you, Susan. And uh, I wanna add my thanks to Tom as well. Um, always interesting to hear from you, Tom. You did a great job. And uh, uh, to everybody, I would just say, please keep the questions coming. We'll get to as many of them as we can. I wanna say at the outset, thank you to Susan and her outstanding team at MEC. It's a pleasure for us at CSG to be able to partner with them this morning and bringing you this uh, virtual forum. And I wanna start, start by saying, uh, uh, extending greetings on behalf of CSG to all of you. Um, it's my privilege this morning to introduce our outstanding guest panelists. As Susan mentioned at the outset, we have uh, prevailed upon three legislators to join us here. Uh, each will share a few comments and observations of their own and just to, to sort of start the conversation and then we'll open it up to, to Q&A. And as I say, hopefully get to as many questions as we, as we can here today. Um, I'm going to introduce all three of the legislators who will be participating on the panel uh, together at the beginning, and then we'll just call on them one at a time um, to, to deliver their opening remarks. First, we're pleased to be joined this morning by North Dakota Senator Karen Krebsbach. Uh, Senator Krebsbach has served in the North Dakota Senate since 1989. Uh, she plays a number of roles there. Among them, she serves as vice chair of the Interim Higher Education Funding Committee. Senator Krebsbach is a realtor and small business owner in Minot, North Dakota, where she serves on the Minot State University Board of Regents and on the Minot State University Foundation Board. So welcome to you, Senator Krebsbach. Uh, Senator Krebsbach will be joined also this morning by Representative LaShawn Ford from Illinois. Uh, Representative Ford hails from Chicago. He has served in the Illinois House since 2007, which if my math is correct, means that he's finishing his seventh term in the House. Uh, Representative Ford is a licensed real estate broker and insurance agent, also a former teacher in the Chicago public school system. And he chairs the Appropriations Higher Education Committee in the House and is a MEC commissioner. And our final panelist this morning will be um, Ohio Representative Rick Carfagna. Representative Carfagna is serving in his second term in the Ohio House, representing Delaware and Knox counties in central Ohio. He previously worked for 15 years as a government relations manager for Time Warner Cable. He also has extensive uh, experiences in, at the local government level before coming to the Ohio House, where he serves um, on the Finance Subcommittee of Higher Education and also he is a MEC commissioner. So welcome to Senator Krebsbach, to Representative LaFord, and to Representative Carfagna. And with that, we will turn it over to you, Senator Krebsbach, to, for your opening remarks. I believe you're mu muted, Senator Krebsbach. <laughs> I thought I'd be nice and quiet for a while. <laughs> uh, anyway, good morning. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction. And good morning to all who are joining us via this network. Uh, we're embarking on a new way of dealing with the issues of today. And I think it's working out very well in many of the instances that I've been involved with on this type of system. Uh, it's been really amazing what can be accomplished online these days. Uh, I am, uh, as you said, in the North Dakota Senate and have been there since 1988 was my first election. I have uh, served in a number of committees, uh, including industry, business and labor, uh, education, agriculture, and I chaired for several sessions our Veterans and Government Affairs Committee. I am cur currently a vice president of our appropriations committee, which handles all state budgets, including higher education. Uh, I did have the opportunity as well of serving as president pro tem in our Senate in the 2001 session. Uh, my private background was that of a family owned business, a farm equipment and motor truck dealership. We dealt with the farm rural population and we dealt with the truckers from the farm truckers to the over the road uh, tra uh, transportation people. And uh, much of my background was that in dealing with not only the customers, but with the manufacturing people who represented the gut lines that we carried. So it was a, a great experience to bring forward to this job that I'm now doing. I spent 35 years in that business. Uh, other than that, you know, I 
I really think the most important thing that we can do here today is to hear what you have concerns about. And I wait the questions and the conversation that takes place. Thank you. Great, thank you, Senator Krebsbach. And we'll turn next to Representative, Lef uh, Representative Ford. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you um, for hosting this um, very timely um, MAC um, forum you know, because it is something that proves that we um, have a program, a platform in place to respond to what's happening. I couldn't imagine um, higher ed without this at this time. So Susan, thank you and um, Katie for the work that you've done to put this together. You know, in Illinois, we're seeing um, higher ed change. And I think everyone's seeing higher ed change right before our eyes. So it's really good to have a compact like this so that we can learn from one another and put together best practices because we know that we can no longer have higher ed as it was. We know that school will be starting again. And the question is, what will it look like when um, the fall comes and students um, return? And so I think that it's so very important that we have this um, compact and this uh, gathering to um, bring us all together and make sure that we can understand best practices so that we could take care of higher ed in our states. So thank you so very much and I'll um, turn it back over to the host. Thank you very much Representative Ford and we'll turn next to Ohio Representative Rick Carfagna. Thank you, Mike. Thank you everyone for being on. Um, again, I'm Rick Carfagna. I have a district here in central Ohio. I do have the nor northernmost part of the city of Columbus, but I also pretty much have a, a lot of the outer suburbs. Uh, and I also do have a rural county as well. So I have kind of an interesting blend of uh, constituencies. Uh, it is my third year as a legislator. I'm in my second two year term. Uh, I quickly, I kind of want to paint a picture of where we are in Ohio uh, and where we've been. So uh, we're in the process of doing a lot of reopenings this month. This past Friday, we reopened uh, barbershops, salons, uh, day spas, nail salons. Um, we also reopened bars and dine-in restaurants, but for outside dining only. Uh, this coming Thursday will be a big date for us. Uh, we're going to be reopening uh, inside dine-in for bars and restaurants, uh, also reopening all of our campgrounds. Uh, horse racing will resume uh, on Friday, but without spectators, and the casinos and the racing will remain closed. Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at uh, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. I know everybody's waiting on that one, right? Uh, but we did extend all the licensures through uh, December, so um, people will be okay on that end. But the big one for next week will be the gyms, the fitness centers, health clubs, and pools. That's on May 26th. Uh, Non-contact, limited contact sports leagues. Um, and then I'd say the biggest one will be uh, at the end of the month on May 31st, and that's child care, child care and day camps. And this is a little bit of a catch-22 for us because, you know, we want to get people off unemployment. We want to get them back to work. But, you know, it's going to be tricky if, if child care options haven't been fully restored. And they're going to be coming back but with much smaller adult-to-children ratios in place. Uh, there is going to be CARES Act money to um, kind of help um, cover the, the cleaning costs and the smaller class sizes. But, you know, it's gonna, it remains to be seen if uh, the providers can reopen and if they do for how long and how can they sustain with those types of cost margins. And then um, also what happens to the families that can't find the child care outlets because they have reduced capacity. Uh, just to kind of give a quick background, so March 5th uh, is kind of uh, when the first action was taken in Ohio. Uh, we had the Arnold Sports Festival here in Columbus. That's Arnold Schwarzenegger's big international uh, fitness festival. Uh, we have 20,000 athletes that compete from over 80 countries and 60,000 spectators. And uh, the governor and uh, the, the mayor worked to actually shut that down at the time. Uh, and that was before we had even reported a single case in Ohio. Uh, Governor DeWine was the first in this country to declare a statewide shutdown of all K-12 schools. Uh, he invoked a, an emergency public, pu public health order to postpone our, um, our primary election the night before it was to take place. Uh, our Ohio legislature later convened and we um, set a concluding date of April 28th and we made the remainder of it by absentee ballot only. But um, uh, Ohio, we're seventh in overall population in the country. We have 11.7 million. 
Uh, we are currently 16th in the U.S. in cases. We are 13th in the U.S. in deaths. We have over 1,600 deaths. Uh, our big hot spots as of late have been nursing homes and prisons. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I mean, Ohioans by and large, we are overwhelmingly supportive of the actions that have been taken by Governor Mike DeWine. There was a poll that Baldwin Wallace University convened three weeks ago that showed 85% approval rating of the job that the governor has done. Uh, but look, we've got more than 1.1 uh, million unemployment claims filed over the last eight weeks. That exceeds the total, the combined total over the last three years. Uh, so to put it in perspective, uh, 364,600 claims were filed for all of last year. And here we are at 1.1 million. Um, you know, just to kind of close, uh, we are in, we're still in triage mode here in Ohio. And the type of future clarity that I know would be loved to have had across all the sectors, you know, we just, it's just not there yet. Uh, I, I'm married to a K-12 assistant principal, and there's not a day that goes by where she's not on a Zoom call with your peers, and she'll ask, you know, hey, has the governor made any announcements on K-12? And the answer is no. Uh, but, you know, we need to deal with the now. Uh, we need to deal with the businesses and the organizations that are still shuttered entirely and uh, with the Ohioans that are still out of work before we can really shift our focus to the entities that will be revving up this fall. Great, thank you so much, Representative Carfagna. And thank you to all three of our panelists. At this time, I think we're ready to open it up for questions. Susan, do you wanna take the first one? Yeah, and I think um, we've got some questions actually, interestingly, thank you, Tom, being answered on in the sidebar here. So I think um, some of those questions for Tom, we'll keep up with those. I've got a couple that I'll, we'll lead with that we worked on together. And then we'll be looking for questions from all of you, questions and comments from all of you coming up in that chat function. So Mike and I will kind of tag team on that. Um, I'm gonna start with a question that's kind of combines two of, two of the questions that we prepared um, for the legislators. And I know um, Representative Ford ha is kind of running between a, kind of a, an urgent hearing and this, this, uh, this call. So if he's not able to respond right away, he'll respond as soon as he steps back. Um, I want to say into his office, um, in, into the call. Uh, so what messages have you been receiving from higher education officials in your state um, during this week? And um, how, are they, how are they talking about the summer and fall? Um, and I'll uh, ask um, Senator Kreb Krebsbach first. I know you're in a, in, a, in a city that has actually a university, Minot State, um, right there. Uh, how are you, what messages are you hearing from higher education officials um, in the state and particularly with respect to summer and fall? And then um, Representative Carfani and Representative Ford, if you could also respond to that, that would be great. Thank you, uh, thank you for the question, Susan. Uh, it, it was just this past week that our State Board of Higher Education unanimous, unanimously supported uh, uh, the approval of having students return to campus in the fall of this year. Uh, they are working to assure maintaining a safe environment, not only for the students, but the faculty and the staff as well. They've established a North Dakota University System Smart Return to Campus Task Force. This task force will be headed up by Dr. Josh Wynn, who is the uh, Dean of the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health. Uh, they, they will be visiting and analyzing each of the 11 campuses in our state system. There will be a, a very variety of um, guidelines that they will be instituting and their task force will be doing uh, subcommittees in the three areas that we have. We have the two-year research institutions, we have two of them, and we have four four-year institutions in our state, and then we have five two-year campuses, and they will be visiting with each of these campuses and setting up subcommittees so that the best process can be handled for reinstituting our classwork back in the fall. Now, what's going to happen there? Part of it could be online. If it's going to be in the classroom, there will be spacing distances for the students and all of this will be considered. Uh, I think that uh, 
they, they will be definitely taking the best care that they can possibly put out for the students and, and all that are in these university settings. Uh, we, we don't know what to expect really because there's just the big, big unknown with what's going to actually happen. And I think we are definitely in for a world of transition in higher education. But we can, we will survive, we will stomach through it, and we will do the best we can. Thank you. Um, Representative Ford and then Representative Kafania, could you just touch on what you're hearing from higher ed officials in your state and what are they saying about this summer and fall? And then we've got a couple questions coming up in the sidebar from the audience that we'll move to after this. Um, I did want to mention that um, we're going to, our guests have agreed to stick around um, if they can um, for another 10, 15 minutes. So until 11, 15 or so central time. Um, so those of, uh, those of you, if the conversation's still going and, and there are folks that want to um, continue, um, uh, please do so. So with that, um, Representative Ford, what are you hearing from folks in your state? Well, we're hearing one, of course, like everyone else, concerned about um, <clears throat> higher ed, the future of higher ed, and whether or not we're going to have a lot of attrition coming back to the universities. That's a big concern. The higher ed budget is uh, a big concern. And we're trying to work with the public health department to do everything that we can to put together a reopen um, plan so that families could feel that it's going to be safe to come back to the uh, university. So the governor has um, established a reopen plan for the entire state. It's our goal in Illinois to make sure that we um, be the safest so that we can take your students. <laughs> mm -hmm. all, from all our border states. It's just, so um, yeah, we, we are working very hard with the governor and with the, um, with the Department of Public Health for Reopen Illinois. Representative Carfagna? Sure. Well, I mean, I, I, I think it goes without saying that, you know, the Ohio higher ed community, they certainly want to give parents and students good information in May. Um, and, and I just, that's, that's just gonna be tricky to do with, with so much uncertainty. Uh, the public colleges here in Ohio, they're concerned about the cuts to the state share of instruction. That's Ohio's primary mechanism for subsidizing instructional costs. Uh, the private colleges, meanwhile, they don't, they don't get that direct state support, but they're worried about the state cuts to need-based uh, financial aid for students, um, such as the Ohio College Opportunity Grant. Um, and, and, you know, the unfortunate thing was, you know, we just came out of, a, uh, of an operating budget, a biennial budget uh, last year, where we saw uh, record investments in both of those areas. So that's, that's, that's what makes things even more frustrating. We were really starting to get on a good trajectory where we needed to be. And now we're going to be taking, you know, a couple steps back. Um, you know, if, if the pandemic continues, if the colleges can't reopen their dorms and resume some semblance of normal enrollment, I mean, that's going to endanger a couple of campuses. And we're already seeing that. Uh, one private university, Urbana University, um, they've, already, uh, they've already announced they're going to be closing at the end of the 2020 spring semester. This is a 170-year-old institution. It was founded in 1850. Uh, the closure is going to impact 350 students, uh, 111 full-time employees. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Ohio University, on the public side, Ohio University announced they're going to be laying off 140 employees at the end of May. Uh, these are uh, custodians, culinary, and maintenance staff. Uh, but they've also, re they've also issued non-renewal notices to 53 instructional faculty members on their contracts. And they're going to be net reducing, uh, I think, around 94 administrator positions. Uh, the University of Akron. Uh, they recently announced they're going to be, they have to go uh, from an annual budget of 325 million down to 260 million. That's a difference of 65 million. And they have to do it by July. They are going to be consolidating. Uh, it's 11 colleges down into five. They're going to be combining several departments, uh, but they're not going to eliminate any degrees as of yet. Uh, but once that's complete, each of the newly formed colleges is going to have to cut up to 25% of their budgets. And then on top of that, uh, University of Akron announced they're going to be reducing its athletic programs. They're going to be doing away with men's cross country, uh, the men's golf team, and the women's tennis team. And that's going to impact, I think, 
uh, 23 male and uh, nine female student athletes. And uh, it's gonna be a total cuts of around 4.4 million just for those three sports programs. So uh, we're, we're feeling it already. Now to be fair, I mean, those three institutions that I just mentioned were already having financial difficulties going into the COVID crisis. Uh, but you know, we're, we're seeing these things being obviously accelerated a lot more. Wow, tough, tough challenges. Thank you, Representative Carfania. Um, we're going to move to a couple of questions that uh, folks um, have submitted via the chat function. And I'll start with uh, one from Suzanne Morris, who posed a question about, and this is addressed to everybody, so uh, Tom and panelists, um, what role will testing have if and when students return to campuses? We assume she's referring to COVID testing. Anybody want to comment on that one? Well, here in Ohio, it's tough to say. Here in Ohio, it's tough to say just because, I mean, we're, we're supposed to have an influx of testing kits. Um, it, it remains to be seen kind of how those are going to be distributed. I mean, I think you know, obviously we want to get those in healthcare facilities first. Uh, nursing homes and long-term care facilities have been mentioned as kind of the first priority for the testing kits. But, you know, we're, we're still in a position where we're trying to figure out how those are going to be distributed, you know, whether it's going to come from the Ohio Department of Health, whether it's going to be rolled out from our local uh, health districts, or whether it's going to be our hospital systems. So um, it's, it's, it's really too soon to tell um, how testing is going to play a part in, um, in, in higher ed, at least here in Ohio. Senator Kressbach or Representative Ford, either of you? Uh, yes, I'll just mention quickly that uh, a recent report from our governor's office, uh, which was actually on the uh, last week, that uh, North Dakota is the nation's second highest per capita area for testing. In fact, we have 63 tests per 1,000. And I think the national average is like 29 or 30. Uh, of course, we do have the benefit of having a low population. But at the same time, that is a remarkable record we have. And this is really being stepped up greater in the eastern part of our state, uh, as there seems to be a, a bit of hotbed there at this time, and uh, which is to be expected. It is the area where the greatest population of our state lives. Uh, and then uh, as a result of all of this, we are the fifth lowest in the rate of positive tests in the nation per capita. So we have a lot to be proud of, but we can't let our guard down. We still have to keep the safe living up, you know, with the uh, stay at home if you can, and watching the crowds and all of this. Wearing masks, that's important. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I, and I have to tell you that um, that's why this compact is um, important because I don't know if testing has come up for our universities yet because we're so concerned about the general population. And I heard the previous speaker say about long-term care facilities and just making sure that there are lots of testing um, sites available in the community at large. So that is something that I definitely took note of and I, I will definitely work with the universities to see if we're going to be um, able to come up with a testing um, strategy and plan to reopen. That's fantastic. Thanks for that question. Thanks, Representative. Tom, did you want to weigh in on that one or shall we move? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that um, from what I've heard that you know, universities are developing plans right now. I mean, certainly like the flagship universities, you're, you're taking students from all around the country so um, and in some cases all around the world. So developing a protocol for um, te not only testing, but also contract, you know, tracing, you know, if there, there's outbreaks on campus as well as quarantine. So, um, and it, it's a complex issue um, and it's, um, it, it's, it's a real concern, especially because universities are, are, are built to, to bring people together. You know, you have uh, dorm rooms where, where there are two students and it look, looks like now, um, potentially there could be a uh, movement towards having maybe one student in the dorm instead of two. Um, so that's a, it's a real concern that, that, that I'm hearing. Um, uh, and, and the, of course, as, as the previous speaker said, the, the availability of those tests um, and whether those tests are, are, are going to be um, ready to go um, when students come back in the fall. So 
um, it's it's a real concern. Thank you, Tom. We had a we had another question. This one is also addressed to all of the panelists. Um, it comes from Mary Masher in Iowa, um, inviting you to comment on potential liability issues that universities may face, particularly if there are additional outbreaks come the fall. Well, I, I'll go first. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I'm on a house uh, COVID-19 recovery task force, and we've heard from over 100 small businesses throughout the, the state and across all sectors of the economy. Um, and that's one of the universal concerns that we hear is, is liability protection. Um, we do have a number of small work groups here in the house that are uh, trying to tackle different segments of the economy and, and some different recovery strategies. But one of these is handling torts and immunity. Um, we do have a bill that has already been uh, introduced and is having hearings. Um, and, and the thought with the liability protection, first and foremost, is gonna be on the healthcare realm. Uh, where we want to grant medical providers, and that includes nursing homes, with uh, complete immunity related to the treatment or non-treatment of COVID patients, unless there is what is, quote, and unquote, willful, willful or wanton misconduct, uh, which is a higher level of protection than generally provided. Uh, but the examples of those that would be covered under the bill would be uh, Ohio businesses, hospitals, healthcare workers, volunteers, grocery stores, churches, uh, delivery drivers, and uh, business employees. Uh, so I, I think what the, the thought is that we want to take the, the so-called good, good Samaritan laws uh, and apply them to this pandemic. That, you know, if you're a business or an organization facility and you're, you're trying to do the right thing and you can demonstrate that, I mean, we, there has to be an understanding that we just, you can't provide a 100% um, safe environment. Uh, but, you know, we, would, we do want to recognize that, you know, people are trying to do the right thing out there and give them some sort of uh, protection from liability concerns. Now, that being said, you know, we have to inspire confidence in our businesses, not only to reopen quickly, uh, but we need to build back consumer confidence. I mean, we have to ensure a safe and healthy environment for employees and, and customers. So it's a work in progress. Um, I, I think there's political will to do this. It's just going to be a question as to the, the level of standards that we apply and whether or not it's going to be scaled back to only certain commercial entities or whether we are going to extend it to entities like higher ed and like our K through 12 schools. It's going to be a tricky balance, that's for sure. Um, I think that it's, it's critical that, that we, um, like I said in the opening, that Illinois and I know all of the states, the number one priority is to make sure that we open safely. Um, I think that what's going to be um, critical with the testing and liability is that the universities communicate now with their um, current students and that the universities become messengers because they're going to have to communicate to um, the student body and those that's interested in coming to higher ed um, as freshmen or returning, but they're going to have to join the um, conversation about safety at universities. Legally, I think that um, it's going to be something that um, will uh, higher ed and public universities will be just like any other business, as Rick said. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, uh, Karen here. I somehow lost my <coughs> visual contact, but we can hear I'm you. still here. Good. Uh, <coughs> I just was visiting with a fellow senator in regard to this issue this morning. And uh, he very smartly said, we are going to be looking at changing a lot of things because of this liability issue, including faculty contracts, board and room agreements, and many things that we are doing. Even our online classes will be subject to liability. Uh, in fact, there are cases now that are going on that are waiting to be resolved or to be heard. And uh, it, it'll be interesting to see what the outcome of this will be. But we do have a, 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 a whole new challenge with this liability issue on campuses at this time. So, you know, uh, there are students, like I say, that are suing because they don't feel they got their money's worth out of an online class. Well, whose responsibility is this? Mm -hmm. Is it the institution? Is it the faculty? Is it the student themselves? 
And these are all things that will be resolved in the future. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to note a couple things in the sidebar here. I know you can all see this, but um, we are recording this again, and will the questions and everything will be preserved so that we'll, we'll be we'll uh, provide all of this to you. Um, and I think Mike has agreed to put this info on his website um, as well. There are a couple of questions. I know we're getting close to um, the hour, and um, our folks, if, as they're able, have agreed to stick around for another 10 to 15 minutes afterwards. Um, I wanted to just note that um, Representative Balwick has um, said the U of Wisconsin is doing several furlough days for staff, um, that uh, uh, President Eisler at Fair State, who's one of our uh, commissioners also, has said that there's a really good um, uh, example of higher ed reentry when you read the report on um, the subcommittee um, on reopening in Connecticut, I think you said, um, President, President Eisler, great. We, and we'll get a link to that and provide that to folks too. There are a couple questions, and then Tom has provided um, for you a link on liability issues. There's some testimony um, that um, is uh, interesting, I think, that he's provided. Um, but why don't I take one of these questions, and then Mike, you can take the other. There's one on sports. I'm going to leave that one for you. Um, but I'm going to take a question from Mike Cartney, um, South Dakota, who is the uh, president of um, uh, the Tech College um, there and uh, in Watertown. Are there any other, are colleges looking at the use of tracking applications such as CARE 19? Um, I was interested in that as well. I've got a student who, my own child is a senior in high school moving hopefully to college in Wisconsin in the fall. And I was thinking about this myself, you know, is that something I'm for or against as a parent? And then as a policy person, you know, how do I feel about it? But um, anybody have a response for Mike um, or maybe uh, Mike, you want to expand on that on um, the use of tracking applications. Tom, maybe you want to start. On the tracking applications, I yeah, I haven't yeah. been uh, I, I haven't seen um, that that colleges are using that. I, I just don't know at this point. I haven't I haven't gotten down to that granular level of detail of whether they're using those um, those tracking applications. Um, one thing I would say that um, the issue of liability, just to go back to that, um, I've gotten numerous questions on that, um, and there's certainly discussions uh, in in Congress about that. Uh, I did provide in the link the legal counsel at TCU um, testified on the Senate Judiciary Committee about that very issue. So uh, people are aware of it. Um, there has been legislation in the states. I know I just saw a bill come across my desk on, from Alabama. I know I think Utah and New York also. So there are state bills out there on, mm -hmm. on this, this liability issue. But as was said, um, it, it, the question is, is what, what the standard of of, of negligence, if it's, you know, gross negligence based right. on, uh, in the university, um, that can, you know, leave an opening for, for students to, to sue if they feel that, you know, the university was very negligent. For our, thank you, Tom. For our legislators, are you hearing anything, um, our, our panelists, are you hearing anything on that tracking um, um, application issue? No, I mean, specifically to CARE 19, I'm not familiar with it, so I, I can't really comment on that or what uh, specific higher ed institutions are doing. Uh, I mean, I know that the governor is working to put together some framework on contact tracing. I don't know right. if that's similar to this or not, but I think <laughs> the state is looking to hire, uh, gosh, I, feel, I think it's like over 1,200 people to, to handle the contact tracing that, that we know is probably going to be needed to um, uh, try to avoid or mitigate uh, any kind of a second spike from happening. Uh, Just to the clarify, state, Susan. Oh, I'm sorry. This is really, if, if I might add, <clears throat> the local public health units in North Dakota are doing the majority of the contact tracing, <clears throat> and there has been additional state support uh, coming through from the, uh, from the feds for that. The governor and the cabinet have been supporting um, connecting with CARE 19. The public is less than enthusiastic about the um, potential jeopardy to privacy. And I guess I'm not totally convinced it's a great idea either. I know it would be, I, I understand what they're telling us. Who all do you trust all that much about it is the question. And, and I don't think we're ever going to be uh, tremendously successful. Perhaps Senator Krebs buys a different uh, attitude about that, but I spent a lot of my life with human services and uh, we're talking about a lot of contact tracing and there is not uh, much public acceptance of that here. Thank you, Senator Lee. Yes, uh, if I may add, Senator Lee is absolutely correct. Uh, we do have, in the state of North Dakota, they're trying to do the tracing of the uh, 
all of the uh, vic victims, I'll say, uh, that have been in this, that have been identified as positive, and they have daily given us briefing or briefings on what is the status of this at this time. Uh, she's right. Do the people accept all of it? Not necessarily. There's a certain bit of an invasion of privacy that goes on that we have to watch out for. And, and suspicion about whether or not the, the information really goes away in two weeks or whatever it is, and that it's really as private as they say. You know, how much does everybody trust Facebook and other entities uh, as far as privacy goes? So, you know, it's trust and verify. We haven't verified yet. Well, do know that. Thank you both. I think that these this is one of those issues in additional liability that we're going to be um, looking at some additional information that we could provide to you. Thank you. Um, uh, Mike, do you want to take, there was a question that sure. came up, what's going to happen with sports in the fall, which is an important one. Um, and then also there was a question on the sidebar here about um, what happens uh, um, to, for example, community and tech colleges. Um, you know, in efforts to kind of ramp up capacity. Um, do you want to take those couple of questions, sure. Mike? Absolutely. So the first one comes from um, Reynold Mesaba in, um, in South Dakota, and this was addressed to everyone. Any sense of the NCAA position on sports competition this fall? Will we be gathering in stadiums, playing football, that sort of thing? Anybody heard anything reliable? <laughs> well, I, 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 I I can tell you that Governor DeWine has renewed his Ohio State football tickets. So I think reading between the lines, that's, that's a great sign. Uh, nothing definitively has been announced. However, um, you know, we're, we're, we're still waiting to see. I mean, it's possible you could have a shortened season. It is possible you could limit uh, attendance. And I don't know how they'll, how they'll do that. Uh, we have two uh, pro sports teams here in Ohio. We have the Cleveland Browns and the Cincinnati Bengals. I'm a big Browns fan myself. My man Tom Walsh is on this call, he, as is he, with our Ohio Community Colleges. Um, and, you know, the, and Commissioner Goodell, I know, has talked about possibly either a shortened season or even playing to no spectators. Uh, I think there is something to be said with, you know, these television contracts to at least playing the games. Uh, and I'm talking strictly about football, obviously, but playing the games at least, uh, even if it is to an empty audience, uh, as surreal as that might be. But uh, I mean, indications are that we will have fall sports. Uh, I just don't really know, um, you know, in terms of um, uh, making it a public spectacle, what, what that's going to look like. I would agree. I think uh, if you are finished, uh, uh, I think we will be seeing fall sports. Uh, to what extent that remains to be seen? I think the biggest question is, what is the spectator view going to be? Is it going to be on site? in attendance? If so, there'll be spacing and other things going on. Or will it be online or on television? That's probably the biggest question that will be dealt with. Great. All right, unless somebody else wants to weigh in, we'll, we'll go on to the, to the next question. This one comes from Tom Walsh. It says, um, outside of higher ed to help offset revenue cuts, we know there will be a need to quickly ramp up workforce and short-term training for displaced workers. For community and technical colleges, this will come at a time when we are experiencing significant cuts from the state. Is Congress looking at funding to help institutions ramp up their capacity or are there good state examples to look at? And this question was addressed to all of you. Well, this is Tom. I would say that, um, yeah, I mean, the, the discussions on the next um, stimulus package, uh, the aid to states is going to be, be top of mind. Um, and that would in, include uh, aid to, to institutions of higher education, um, be it uh, two-year tech colleges or, or, or four-year institutions. So um, yes, yes, Congress is, is definitely looking at this. I know you know, traditionally in recessions, um, higher education enrollment is countercyclical. So that means that um, as as the as the economic conditions kind of deteriorate, the uh, more people go on to 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 higher education, uh, particularly at at the two year level. So, but this is a this is a certainly a unique um, unique circumstance. So um, we'll we'll have to see. But yes, I think this is um, the 
the, the challenges states are facing is, is um, one of the real um, issues that uh, Congress is going to deal with, I think, in the months ahead. Great. Thank you, Tom. Susan, I don't see other questions on the on the side. Do you have any? Before I leave. Yeah, sorry, Representative. I just want to tell everyone, um, stay safe, and I have to sign off. And I hope that we as higher ed um, um, advocates recognize that the country definitely need to make sure that higher ed becomes a institution for um, innovation. As we see in America, we have been struggling just to get masks, struggling to get ventilators. So we hope that this will uh, make our higher ed institutions um, inventors again. And, and, and that, that would be great. So I want to thank you all. And I'm sorry I had to cut in and sign off. I wanted to say goodbye. Thank you, Representative Ford. Um, you know, we've got lots of other questions we could ask, but maybe this is a good time to pause unless there's another pressing question that comes up in the queue here. Um, as I mentioned, um, we've recorded this session. Um, we've gotten some great ideas from you. And, you know, one of the things we've been talking about at the Midwestern Higher Education Compact is whether we ought to have sort of a task force um, that combines um, our policymaker legislators um, as well as higher ed leaders together um, to kind of think about um, these issues as we move through the summer and fall. You know, we all like to plan, but it's really hard to plan, <laughs> um, you know, given what's going on. You know, most of us li are living here and, um, and it's difficult. So do any of our panelists have any closing remarks? And um, um, after you uh, comment, I think Mike and I will close things off. Um, so uh, I know Representative Ford had to go, Representative Carfagna or Senator Krebsbach. Uh, well, I guess I can give you a few closing remarks. I think we have to take a look at this time and place as an opportunity. For some time, we have been hit with the question of reform in higher education. And I think this now gives us that opportunity to do things that we have not done in the past. Change is never easy. But the change that has been forced on us in this time is something that we have to deal with in a collaborative way. We need to put the best heads together and we need to find out what is it that higher ed should be and can be to the people, the students, the public, everyone. We need to uh, look at it from a standpoint of I know dollars are important and we do need jumpstart dollars in many ways with the changes that we're going to be facing. However, money isn't everything. We need the collaborative efforts of people from all levels, be it in the institutions, be it from the public. We need the innovative ideas to help us go into the future for tomorrow. So I guess if I have any closing remarks, it's let's take care of these young people with what they really want and need. Thank you. Representative Carfagna. Sure, well, I, I mean, I, I think that we really need to take a look at the, some of the shifting economic trends that are resulting from the pandemic and we need to evolve accordingly, not, not just a, you know, in, in terms of the, the private sector, but also in the public sector and, and higher ed across the board. I mean, it's, and it's all going to be very nuanced and specific to everyone's geographies. I know I was on a call with uh, an economic development consultant last week, and, you know, he made a number of observations just specific to central Ohio. Um, you know, in, in the wake of this pandemic, I know we can expect to see an increase in things like fulfillment centers with the surge in online shopping. Uh, we're going to see a shift in the supply chain as more items are going to be manufactured in the U.S., so they'll be closer to businesses. Um, here in Ohio, we're going to continue to see a surge in uh, uh, data centers uh, being constructed because working from home is, is more and more the norm, and that necessitates cloud-based services. So, you know, what can we extrapolate from those things alone? Well, you know, I think we're going to need to make a push for more higher ed programs and things like logistics, computer science, mechanical engineering, 
uh, but also we're going to have to focus on short-term certificates, associate's degrees, and our skilled trades. And, you know, a lot of that is, is things that we were already pushing to do even before the pandemic. But, you know, the last two months, uh, I, I think it's really shifted some of the mindsets around uh, the, in terms of telecommuting, distance learning, telehealth options. Um, you know, I, t I know uh, uh, Tom made mention of uh, 60 Minutes last night. I watched that segment, too. It was a good interview with uh, the Fed chairman, Jerome Powell. And he provided some good perspective. He said that, you know, he reminded us that, you know, the economy was in excellent shape when this hit. Uh, so the downturn that we're facing, it's not necessarily market driven. I mean, it's the result of a government driven lockdown. So, you know, if, if people like the Fed chairman and other financial experts think that we're going to see growth in the second half and a quicker recovery, I'm, I'm going to gladly hope for that. Uh, but I think, you know, now is the time. I mean, we, we it's, this is going to expose, I think, flaws in business models that are out there, um, you know, for different higher ed uh, facilities. I mean, I, people are going to, we're going to have to look like, you know, is there a reliance and over-reliance on international students? Um, you know, are we focusing too much on the residential college experience? Uh, do, you know, do we have issues with the high tuition, high discount type model? You know, we have a sticker price that, you know, almost nobody pays, you know, full, full cost of. So, you know, I'm not saying whether, you know, and it's all going to be specific to everybody's institutions. I'm not saying that any of those are right or wrong, but, you know, this is the time to really assess that. And it's forcing the conversation here in Ohio, you know, with facilities like Urbana University, with Ohio University, with the University of Akron. So I, I just hope that, you know, higher ed, I mean, you know, we, we, we have to look more globally at this and look at some of the economic ramifications of how people are going to change how, they, how they're doing business. And uh, we're going to have to adjust accordingly. Thank you. Well, I'm going um, to I'm going to hand this off to Mike next, but um, we'll close here. Thank you to our panelists and thanks to all of you. It's a really fun to see what a great cross section of folks that have joined us from policymakers um, all across the political spectrum um, to our higher education leaders across um, our uh, our 12 state region, which um, uh, we're we're in. Um, we're a census region. Uh, I think some of you may know that the 12 states are the Midwestern census region. So I'm very grateful to all of you. And um, as I mentioned, we'll get all the questions. Um, there's some good links that have been provided. All this will be up on our website with the recording. If this is something that was helpful to you and you'd like us to do it again, let us know. We'll send a survey out um, following, uh, following this session that you'll receive. And with that, um, I express my gratitude to my colleague, Mike. Um, Mike, any closing remarks? Thank you, Susan. I also want to say thanks to, uh, to you and to the MEC team for uh, allowing us to join, join you in sponsoring this morning's event. Special thank you to Senator Krebsbach, to Representative Carfagna, to Representative Ford, and to Tom Harnish for serving as panelists and presenters this morning. You all did a great job and we're grateful to you for your participation. Beyond that, I'll just add that uh, I noticed that Representative Joan Balwig from Wisconsin was on the call. She is CSG's national chairman this year, so a special shout out to Representative Balwig. And if anybody would like to um, continue the conversation on, on state responses that are related to the challenges that uh, are being driven by the pandemic, I would invite you to consider taking part in a webinar that the Midwestern Legislative Conference is sponsoring on Thursday of this week. It's the latest installment in this ongoing series of webinars looking at various issues. This week's uh, installment will focus on uh, relief and recovery, strategies to rebound from the economic downturn. It's presented by the Economic Development Committee of the Midwestern Legislative Conference. And it's free to all comers. So just uh, visit our website, csgmidwest.org, if you'd like to take part. Otherwise, thank you again for taking part in today's event. And uh, thank you, Susan. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye.